Christopher Columbus has become a controversial historical figure. Acclaimed for centuries as the discoverer of America, he wasn't. He has gained notoriety for the decimation of the native peoples that he encountered. Obsessed with obtaining gold and slaves in order to pay off debt and impress the king and queen of Spain, he ended up as an outcast, unwanted in the place that he discovered and sent back to Spain in disgrace. In this week's biographics, we're looking at the uncomfortable truth about Christopher Columbus. There is no agreed upon date as to when Christopher Columbus entered into the world. Some historians put the date as early as 1436, but others claim that it was as late as 1455. The majority agree, though, that he was likely born sometime between August the 25th and October the 31st in 1451. The place of his birth, though, that's something we do know for certain. It's the Italian coastal city of Genoa. Christopher was the oldest of five children, born to Susanna Fontana Rosa and Domenico Colombo. The name Columbus is an English derivation of the Italian Colombo. Domenico was a weaver and an innkeeper, but he was also a keen seafarer, and his love of the ocean would soon transfer to his oldest son. As early as age 10, Christopher ranged up and down the Genoese harbor in borrowed single-man sailboats and dreamed of venturing out into the vast expanse beyond. We know very little about Christopher's early life, but we do know that his father was able to provide a modest yet comfortable living for the family family, and that he was a kindly, involved man who brought his sons up with strong biblical morals. We don't even know if young Christopher went to school. It was recorded that he was of great intellect, but little education, and so he may have been illiterate when he left home at around the age of 20. Still, he overcame his lack of formal education by teaching himself many valuable skills, including map-making, functional mathematics, and a range of languages, including Spanish, Latin, and Portuguese. By the time he sailed to the Americas, he had also learned to read and to write. It is generally agreed that Columbus first went to sea at the age of 14. He began his maritime career as a messenger and worked his way up to the position of common sailor. For the next six years, he worked on a variety of ships that plied the European oceans. A legend has emerged that at the age of 21, Columbus tried his hand at piracy. He was in the employ of Duke René of Anjou, who had appointed the young man to capture a warship in the Tunis Harbour in North Africa. En route, the men with Columbus got timid and persuaded him to turn back to France and gather reinforcements. The story goes that during the night, Columbus played a trick on his men by altering the ship's compass so that they sailed south instead of north. When day broke, they were within sight of the target warship, and Columbus managed to rally his men for a successful attack. Many scholars dismiss the account due to the fact that Columbus was only 21, which seems far too young to be given such command. There's more certainty regarding a voyage that he took two years later. The destination was the Greek island of Chios in the Aegean Sea. He and the rest of the crew spent a year on the island. In 1476, at the age of 25, Columbus first ventured beyond the realms of the Mediterranean and into the wider oceans beyond. He was part of a fleet of five ships bound for Lisbon in Portugal. En route, the fleet was attacked by a Franco-Portuguese war fleet. In the ensuing battle, ships from both sides went down with hundreds of men drowning. Columbus was on the Big Hello, which was struck and sunk by a French warship. It was only a stroke of fortune that ended up saving Christopher's life. Diving into the sea, he managed to cling to a floating oar and used it as a buoy to get to the Portuguese shore at Lagos, some six miles away. Luckily, the people of Lagos took him in and got him back to good health. He managed to make his way from there to Lisbon, where he joined up with a large colony of Genoese shipbuilders and merchants. In 1477, he joined a voyage to Iceland, which he described as much beyond the limit of the West. Returning to Lisbon, he learns much of the inner workings of the seafaring trade. This port city was the center of seafaring voyage and discovery. It was the place where stories of what lay beyond were told and schemes of exploration expounded. During this time, Columbus undertook the study of astronomy, geography, and celestial navigation. In 1478, he set off for the three key Atlantic archipelagos. The first island group visited were the Azores, 800 miles west of Portugal. 
Portugal. The other two were the Madeira Archipelago and the Canary Islands. During these voyages, Columbus gained valuable experience on the open sea. On his return to Lisbon, Christopher met and fell in love with a 25-year-old woman by the name of Felipe Moniz. Despite being of noble birth and with family connections to the Portuguese court, Felipe did not come from a wealthy family. When the two were married, just a few months after the courtship began, her father had no dowry to offer. The newlyweds settled in the town of Porto Santo on the Madeira Islands, where Felipe's father had previously been the governor. In 1480, a son was born, and his name was Diego. Soon after giving birth, though, Felipe died. The details surrounding her demise are unclear, but most historians believe that the cause was tuberculosis. By the age of 30, Christopher Columbus had developed a great deal of skill and experience as an ocean voyager. He had traveled as far as Iceland to the north and Ghana to the west. Still, he was fascinated with what lay further out. The area beyond the horizon was known as the Green Sea of Darkness, and there was much speculation about what could be found there. Columbus was convinced that by sailing west, he would eventually end up in Asia. This was a novel idea, and before he could test it out, he needed to gain academic support for his belief. Along with his brother, Bartolomeo, he spent months poring over geographical maps, astronomical books, and other related works. When he found anything that supported his hypothesis, he underlined it and scribbled it into his notepad. Columbus's study led to three key assumptions upon which he funded his belief. Firstly, there was only one ocean, the Atlantic, and he believed it to be narrow. His second belief was that the world was relatively small and that Asia was much closer to Europe than it actually ended ended up being. His final assumption was that there was no large landmass between Europe and Asia. In hindsight, we know that Columbus was guilty of selective research. Anything that didn't support his hypothesis was rejected outright. He gains much support from the writings of Marco Polo and first century cartographer Marinus of Tyre. This convinced him that if he sailed due west, he would reach Asia in less than 3,000 miles. With the scientific backing that he needed, Columbus now set out to find a backer for his planned voyage of discovery. More than mere financial support, he was after a royal backer who could garner him the prestige and status that he would earn by such a perilous journey. In his own words, he wanted to be entitled to call myself Don and should be High Admiral of the Ocean Sea and Viceroy and Governor in perpetuity of all the islands and mainland I discover and gain, or that might thereafter be discovered and gained in the Ocean Sea, and that my elder son should succeed me and his heirs thenceforth from generation to generation forever and ever. In return for such honors, Columbus would bestow the riches of Asia upon the sponsoring sovereign. To back his cause, he quoted from the journals of Marco Polo about the riches of the Orient. Having lived in Portugal for the past eight years, it was only natural that his first request was made to that country's king. But despite his persuasiveness, Columbus's proposal it was rejected. The king viewed this unproved sailor as being vain and conceited, and rather prone to bragging. The fact that, in addition to honors, Columbus also demanded one-tenth of all income derived did not help his cause either. Beyond all that, the vast majority of the king's advisers believed that the plan to reach the Orient by sailing due west was nothing more than a fool's errand. With a round rejection from his adopted country, Columbus set his sights on the king of Spain. By now, the would-be adventurer was 34 years of age, penniless, widowed, and with a young son to care for. Arriving in the Spanish port town of Palos with five-year-old Diego in tow, he first set out to find food, lodging, and a place for Diego to stay as his father made his approach to the king. Columbus made his way to a Franciscan monastery overlooking the port and pleaded poverty. For the next five months, this monastery would be his base. Then, towards the end of 1945, he made his way to Cordoba to seek an audience with King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. He had to wait for the monarchs to return from Madrid, and during this time he met a young woman named Beatriz Enriquez de Harana. She became his mistress, giving birth to his second son Ferdinand on August 15, 1488. The audience before the king and queen was granted on May 1, 1486. Columbus and Isabella developed an immediate bond, being of the same age, and clearly they were like-minded. Still, the monarchs turned the idea over to an investigator. Columbus would have to wait for five and a half frustrating years to learn of their final decision. During that time, he had returned to Lisbon in an attempt to reopen negotiations with the king there, but 
all to no avail. In the end, the Spanish Commission also rejected the plan. Their main reasons for doing so were that a voyage to Asia would require an absence of three years. This was far too long with the available technology and the belief that if a ship did manage to get to the other side of the world, there was no way that it would be able to get back. The final decision, however, was left to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. The king was happy to go along with the commission's recommendation. After all, he disliked Columbus on a personal level. The queen, however, took pains to reassure Columbus that he would be able to resubmit his plan in the future. The Spanish struggle against the Moors at this point had been going on for 700 years, and it was nearly at a conclusion. When this was decided, the queen told him he would get a better reception. On January 2, 1492, the Moorish city of Granada fell to the Spanish. Shortly thereafter, the royal minister of the budget, who was friendly with Columbus, entrusted upon the queen to show favor to the mariner's scheme. She relented, and Columbus, who was then on his way back to Cordoba on the back of a mule, was intercepted and rushed to the royal palace to receive the good news. After waiting for five years, it took Columbus just ten weeks to gather together the three ships, crew, and the supplies that he needed. His three ships, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, were skillfully built and, according to him, were well suited for the task at hand. Columbus gathered a crew of 90 men to be split between the three ships. The fleet left early morning on August 3, 1492. The first stop was the Canary Islands, a thousand miles to the south. There, the ships were refitted and resupplied before heading out into the green sea of darkness. The ships made good progress thanks to strong easterly winds. After some days, they entered into an area known as the Saragossa Sea. All around, the waters were filled with gulfweed, a thick green plant that floated on the surface. At the same time as this was happening, the winds died down to almost nothing. After three weeks at sea, the crew began to sight land-nesting birds. Still, there was no sighting of land. As the weeks passed, with no indications of terra firma, the crew became increasingly agitated. On board the Santa Maria, they were even close to mutant. With things coming to a boiling point, Columbus made an ultimate declaration on October the 10th. If land was not sighted in three days, he promised that he would turn back. Two days later, the long-awaited word came. At 2 a.m. on the 12th, the cry of terror, terror resounded from ship to ship. Ninety pairs of eyes strained to see the islands that were six miles in the distance. Columbus had promised that the first man to sight land would receive a yearly pension of a thousand maravillas for the rest of his life. Yet that man, a sailor named Rodrigo, ever received this reward. Columbus claimed to have seen a light the evening before and gave himself the reward. They had come across an island situated in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. It was populated by Arawak Indians. These were a friendly people, and some of them swam out to meet the newcomers. These people lived in village communes and had developed an agricultural economy. They had no iron implements, but Columbus was quick to notice that they wore tiny pieces of gold in their ears. Columbus was determined to get to the source of the Arawak's gold. He lured some of the natives aboard his ships and then took them as prisoners. He demanded that they guide him to the place where the gold was located. Not having success, he sailed to modern-day Cuba and then to Hispaniola. It was there that his visions of a vast gold empire were rekindled when a local chief presented him with a gold mask. Columbus and his men built a fort on the island of Hispaniola, naming it Navidad Christmas. He left 39 men there with strict orders to find the gold. He then took more prisoners and began for the return journey to Spain. Before leaving, his men killed two natives who refused to trade as many bows and arrows as they demanded. On the return journey, some of the prisoners died from exposure to cold weather. On his return to Spain, Columbus made extravagant claims about what he had encountered. He stated that he had reached Asia when in fact he had landed on Cuba. He also spoke of rivers flowing with gold and an abundance of spices. He promised that with a little more financial help from the king and queen, he could go back and pick up as much gold as they needed and as many slaves as they needed too. The king and queen were suitably enamored. The second voyage was made up of 17 ships and more than 1,200 men. Whereas the first trip had been focused on reaching Asia, now the objective was twofold. Slaves and gold. From island to island, they raged, taking prisoners and demanding that they be led to the gold. As word spread of the impending danger, villagers were evacuated and the sailors who had been left at Navidad were executed. With no gold to be found, Columbus embarked upon a massive slave drive. 1,500 Arawak men, women, and children were thrown into pens, and from them, 500 of the best specimens were chosen to be taken to Spain. 200 of these died on the way back, with the remainder 
being sold at auction. Still, Columbus was desperate to get his hands on the gold. In Haiti, he ordered that every person aged 14 years or over was to collect a minimum quota of gold every three months. Those that succeeded were given a copper necklace to wear. Anyone without the necklace would have their hand cut off. The reality was, though, that there was hardly any gold to be had apart from small amounts that can be found in streams. The result of Columbus's gold obsession was that in two years, the Arawak population was cut in half, with 125,000 people people being murdered, starved to death, or committing suicide. Columbus established his base on Hispaniola and named himself governor of the island. The situation quickly devolved into chaos, though. Most of the Europeans on the island were sick, and many of them were ex-convicts. They occupied themselves by raping the native women and terrorizing the men and children. Looting was rampant, and the quantity of gold gathered was pitiful compared to what Columbus had promised. In October of 1495, a royal inspector arrived on Hispaniola in the wake of worrying reports that had reached the Spanish court. The inspector soon gathered plenty of evidence to implicate Columbus, giving him no choice but to return to Spain in order to defend himself before the king and queen. Setting sail on the Nina, the 45-year-old Columbus arrived back in Portugal on June 11, 1446. He clothed himself in a friar's robe as a sign of penitence and set out to meet the sovereigns at Burgos, which was some 500 miles from his landing port. On meeting the king and queen, he immediately reassured them there was still plenty of gold to be had. He also tried to convince them that he had reached the Malay peninsulas of Southeast Asia. As a final enticement, he told the monarchs that he was convinced that there was a whole new continent lying just to the south of the islands that he had landed on. To his surprise and great pleasure, the king and queen were willing to overlook the bad reports that they had received. Further, they agreed to finance another voyage specifically to confirm the existence of this new continent. However, Columbus would have to wait a further two years before adventuring again. This time, the sovereigns insisted that he take with him colonists rather than soldiers. The third voyage, therefore, included 30 women, 50 farmers, 20 mechanics, and 10 gardeners, along with 30 sailors. The fleet consisted of six ships, which Columbus split into two separate commands. The first three ships headed to Hispaniola with supplies for the colony that was located there. The remaining ships made up the Discovery Fleet. With Columbus at the helm, they took a southerly route to the Indies in search of any lands lying south of the Antilles. Throughout this voyage, Columbus suffered from terrible pains, gout, as well as fever. Land was first sighted on July 31, 1498, and the fleet soon made in at Trinidad. For the next two weeks, they explored the area between Trinidad and the South American mainland. Sailing further west, they saw land again, and it was at this point that Columbus declared they had found the new continent. Having achieved his objective, Columbus set the fleet north for Hispaniola. When he arrived, he found the place in a state of rebellion. While he was gone, many of his men had died mainly from starvation, while those who survived were disgusted at the harsh treatment they had been subjected to under the nominal rulership of Columbus's brother, Bartholomew. Bartholomew was the acting governor while Columbus was away. The rebels were led by a man named Rawdon. Gathering both Spaniards and natives to his cause, he set about the process of overthrowing the fragile government that Columbus had established. After a period of fierce fighting, the exhausted and physically ill Columbus entreated with Roldan for peace terms. Columbus gave in to all of Roldan's demands, including appointing him as mayor and giving land grants to every Spaniard who wished to stay on the island. With this humiliating defeat, Columbus's only desire now was to leave. Meanwhile, news of the latest rebellion had made its way to Spain. The king had sent a man by the name of Francisco de Bobadilla, a servant of the crown and a knight. His mission was to sort the entire situation out. He arrived in Hispaniola to discover that a mass execution of the rebels was underway. Displaying his royal orders, he put a halt to the proceedings and had Columbus and his two brothers thrown into irons. The three brothers were shipped back to Spain. When the people there saw the great Columbus in chains after the ship had docked, they became angry. Hearing of this popular reaction, the king ordered that they be freed. Columbus's reunion with the king and queen was an emotionally charged affair. He threw himself at the queen's feet, and through sobs, he kissed her hands and feet. He pleaded innocence, saying that any wrongs he had committed were the result of ignorance and not wickedness. 
The sovereigns took pity on him and promised to restore his wealth and titles. The king, however, was convinced that while he may be superior at sea, Columbus was no governor of men on land. Still, his skills as a voyager were an asset that could be further utilized. And as a result, Ferdinand authorized a fourth voyage to the West Indies in the hopes of finding a direct route to Asia. However, he was ordered to stay well away from Hispaniola. This time, it was strictly a voyage of discovery. Columbus set forth on this final voyage on May 9, 1502. His fleet reached the West Indies in 21 days. Two weeks later, his three ships encountered a terrible storm, which they managed to see through with no loss of life. The fleet eventually reached the offshore islands of Bonaca, a few miles from Honduras. From there, they encountered terrible sea conditions for 38 straight days, which tested the men to their absolute limits. Finally, they found their way to the Panamanian coastline. Here, they were heartened to find gold in abundance. They spent the next several months traveling up and down the coast, gathering gold, and then they headed back for Hispaniola. But the weather-beaten and worm-eaten ships, they never reached Hispaniola. With the ships taking on water, they barely limped into Jamaica. The ships were now useless, and the party remained stranded for only a year, only to be rescued when two ships arrived from Santo Domingo. Columbus and his men were taken to Hispaniola to recover from their ordeal. But the former governor knew that he was not welcome there. As soon as he could manage it, he found passage on a ship bound for Spain and arrived back on November 7, 1504. Columbus returned to Spain sick, broken, and disheartened. He was so ill that he could hardly stand on his own power. However, he still had the stamina to demand an accounting of his accumulated possessions. The agreements that he had made years ago with Ferdinand and Isabella for a tenth of all bounty had made him a rich man, and he now sought to claim it. As a result, gold was shipped to him, and he was given land in Hispaniola. But the wealth, it came too late for Columbus to enjoy it. In May of 1506, his bad health deteriorated fatally. He became bedridden, and on May the 19th, the priest was called to administer the last rites. He died the next day, moments after whispering, In thy hands, Lord, I command my spirit. He was 54 years of age. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new biographies every Monday and every Thursday. Also, I've got another channel. It's called Today I Found Out. It's sort of like biographics, but way more broad. On that channel, we get deep into all of the details on all sorts of interesting stuff. Check it out through the link on the screen now. But if you're looking for something else to watch right now, why not check out a biography from the archives or a Today I Found Out video over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.